Good evening, everyone. My name is Kent Lee, and I'm the Executive Director of Pacific Arts Movement. We'd like to welcome you to tonight's very special conversation with Pack Arts founder Leanne Kim and filmmaker, writer, and actor Justin Chan on the film Gook, which pre pre premiered at Sundance Film Festival in 2017, where it won the Next Audience Award. Pack Arts had the pleasure of featuring Gook to a sold out audience on closing night of our spring showcase that same year. Tonight's presentation is also the third in a weekly series of Q&As as part of the San Diego Asian Film Festival online, May Madness, a series celebrating Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month. May Madness is a playlist of 30 films sharing stories, both narrative and documentary that give us a look at over a century of Asian American history from various and sometimes untold perspectives. This week, we are highlighting films connected to the 80s and 90s, including Gook, which provides a fictionalized retelling of the events surrounding the LA uprising from a Korean American perspective. We'd also like you to we'll invite you to join us for our final Q&A in the series next Sunday, May 31st for the film, The Paradise We Are Looking For, a collection of four short films featuring San Diego AAPI stories that was also produced by Pack Arts. And which first premiered opening night at the 20th San Diego Asian Film Festival last year. We're only able to do these Q&As with the support of our sponsors, which include Semper Energy, Pacific Islanders and Communications, and the Pan-Asian Staff Association of UC San Diego, as well as our underwriters, the Chinese Consolidated Benevolent Association and House of China. We're also sponsored by a consortium of groups that remind us to participate in this year's census, which helps build inclusive and representative communities throughout the country. If you haven't already, please remember to complete the census. So for those who are new to to this Zoom Q&A format, please take a moment to familiar, familiarize yourselves with the ch chat and Q&A all at the bottom of the screen. The chat button allows you to chat with the panelists or your fellow attendees. And the Q&A Q button is actually where you enter your questions. If you want to take a moment, you can actually begin entering questions at any time and, and when we get to them uh, throughout the Q&A. Finally, let's welcome tonight's moderator, the founder of Pacific Arts Movement, Leanne Kim. Well, all right. Hey, everybody. Thank you, Kent. What a precious opportunity to lead this conversation with someone that I admire and respect so much. So, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce you all, all to my tongues, Justin Chan, an award-winning filmmaker who starred in front of the cam who started in front of the camera, starring in television. Then he rose to fame during the Twilight Saga and started Soul Searching, which is also part of this uh, month's main Madness series. And behind the camera, Justin has directed four films tonight. We're deep diving into the second feature, Luke. Justin, as you can see, is joining us from the cafe in Seoul, South Korea, where it's 10.30 a.m. Good morning, Justin. We're so good to you. Good morning. <laughs> And thank you so much for joining us. Your time is so precious. And so um, I just feel so honored to be leading this discussion. And, you know, I know it's a little early in Korea for this, but out here in California, it's happy hour time. So I wanted to be a good Luna and I pulled out my soju. Oh, there you go. There you go. I pulled out my soju and I want to toast to your success. And then we should also celebrate the fact that this Q&A is at capacity, and we've uh, had to still over to Facebook Live. Now, um, oh, wow. I want to say hi to everybody at Facebook Live. Hello, hello, everyone. Now, I hope you all watched, and if you did, you'll know why I'm kicking this all off with a dance party. So don't you just go back and don't you just go back and dance. Um, let's make the most out of this social distancing. All right. Woo! I love that. Thank you so much. I know you're in a cafe, so everybody they must be what the hell is that guy doing? <laughs> you know what, uh, Justin, you and I, we've had some history together. First time you came to our festival was back in 2009. Do you remember that? Yeah, I think I'm still just as uh, Korean people call it, Sagaji. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> <laughs> I, know, I know for a fact, 
I know for a fact Leanne is like, is like, who the hell is this kid? Where does he get all his entitlement from? Oh, uh, no, and, yeah, and, yeah. and I'm just like that cockroach that just won't go away. No, I just, no, yeah, no. Actually, but I, I'm still here. <laughs> this is a photo. Do you see this photo? This is you and Aaron Yu on stage at our awards gala together. Oh my God. Can you, can you send that to me? Yeah, oh I will. Oh my it's God, the, I love You guys look like you're going to the prom. <laughs> yeah. But wow, I look so young, man. Well, that was uh, 11 years ago. And um, you were wow. there to present Best Feature Film to Z Chun for uh, Children of Invention. Yeah, I actually love that film. I'm yeah, I love it. You're like big time filmmaker now, living large. <laughs> you know? Lots happened since nine, since we first met. Um, and you're living in South Korea during this pandemic. Uh, just, during the, just during the pandemic, not, not, not forever. Okay. Well, how's life in Korea these days? I mean, give us a first-hand view of what things are like and how different it is than here in the U.S. Um, well, you know, I was in post for my for my most recent film. Everything just got shut down, and and uh, and everything for the rest of the year got shut down until people figured out what was going on. So uh, I was. Uh, supposed to do this show but I didn't think I would be able to do it in terms of timing um and then uh I was like shit we were in um quarantine for like two weeks and I, I figured my kid was going crazy and I was like okay I gotta get out of here get me out there like tomorrow and they said uh we don't know about tomorrow but we can probably get you out here in a few days so I got out in three days from that phone call to Korea it's just been it's just been a world of a difference, man. I, I think that, um, I think, I don't know. Yeah, I don't really want to talk politics, um, but I think we, the way we handled it, the country handled it, was a little slow. That's all I, I want to say about it. But, you know, to, to compare, you know, here, it's like nothing shut down. You know, I can go to the park with my kid. My kid is across the street at daycare right now. I go to restaurant bars and I've yeah. been here since mid-March. So I think that's, that's the biggest difference. Cool. And you've been there with your family. I'm seeing a few uh, notes from our audience here. They feel like you have I don't know if there's a way that you could move your camera. So How about this? Yeah. Yeah. Now we can actually see your face. <laughs> cool. Thank you right. so much. Hey, I've been following your journey um, via Instagram and I just love seeing your photos in Korea especially with you and your family and your adorable daughter. She is just the cutest thing. Mm -hmm. And I love this other photo that I found on your Instagram of you and her. Uh, just, she has so much personality. I wonder where she gets it all from. Uh, I, I'm curious, becoming a parent now, how has that changed your perspective on life and especially your approach on uh, filmmaking and being an artist? Well, basically, it's part of the reason I started directing. You know, I had this sort of vision and and plan for where I wanted my life to go. Hopefully, you know, you, you, you make a goal and you try to shoot for it. And I knew I wanted to have a family. I knew I wanted to have a kid. So, you know, I realized being an actor, I was just traveling way too much and living out of hotels. And I just didn't think that was sustainable if, if I wanted to have a family. Um, if I didn't want to have a family, it's fine, but I knew I wanted to have a kid and some stability. So jumping to directing, I'd be fixed in one location for longer during development and writing. And then, you know, and then during pre-production and, and production, you're, you're gone for, I don't know, four or five months, but that's better than being gone all year round. Right. <laughs> so it's, it, you know, in that sense, uh, I was preparing for it. And the way it's changed my art is, um, well, you know, even before that, it's the way it's changed me as a person is, has been profound. You know, I, um, I think I've become much more open. I think I've become much more centered. I think I've become much more patient and, and understanding and compassionate and, and, uh, you know, still things I, I have tons more to work on, you know, in terms, even in those capacities, but but, uh, you know, it's just really opened my heart and, and uh, I think made me more well-rounded beyond are, work. Yeah. And those are all qualities that make you a better artist, a better uh, filmmaker, a better writer, a better 
actor, you know, you develop mm -hmm. a lot more empathy and I understand that because, you know, I'm a parent too and I feel like our children are our best teachers in many ways, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah. let's talk about um, Goop. The, there's a lot of people who are online now who watch the movie. This is part of uh, Pack Arts May Madness series. Um, looking at Asian American history in the 1990s. So Justin, let's talk about your decision on using a racial slur as the title of your film. And I also wanted to talk about this film poster, the way that you presented this film, because there's so many layers to this. So let's first talk about the title, if we can. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, um, you know, I always thought it so, what's the word? so unfortunate that um that you know americans took a word that belongs to us and made it into a racial slur mm -hmm. you know i thought that you know like uh gook as you know in korean means um country and also means soup <laughs> <laughs> um and you know when i started to look into sort of like the etymology of the word, uh, you know, I realized that there's Hanguk, which is Korea, and then there's Miguk, which is what we call America, and Mi is means beautiful, and Kuk is country. So we here we are calling um, America this beautiful place, and Miguk Saran, which is American people, beautiful people. Mm -hmm. Yet they use that word and they flipped it around and made it into a racial slur. And I thought that I mm -hmm. thought there was a deeper sort of uh, motif that can, we can, can, you know, ambiguity to it uh, that I think is also always an art. So, um, you know, and I explain it in the film and I, I, I'll tell you this, when the film first got into Sundance and, you know, Korean newspaper put it out and calls, I started getting calls from angry, older, you know, men being like, you know, what, what is, you should be ashamed of yourself, blah, blah, blah. You know, Korean older men who've been in the United States for a long time and understand what that word, how derogatory it is. And and my response was always like, I understand why you're angry from first before we get into this long debate um, and you being angry at me. I think you got to give the film a chance and understand the intention behind why I did that. Mm. Don't just take things at face value. And I think that, I think that's sort of um, kind of commonplace these days, especially with like, uh, you know, cancel culture and everything, you know, um, things can tend to be one-sided. And I'm not saying that people shouldn't be sort of, uh, you know, shouldn't be punished for, for mis you know, wrongdoings and stuff. But I think there needs to be a conversation to be had and that's what this film is about. It's about two communities at the time who had a lot of racial tension and a lot of conflict and a lot of, you know, bad blood, you know, especially because of uh, Sun Jadu who killed the Tosh Harlins and shot her in the back and got off scot-free, didn't get any jail time. You know, there's a lot of bad blood. And I think the biggest issue was nobody was having a conversation and some sort of open dialogue and try to come to an understanding with one another or try to understand the other person's point of view and we're dealing with that you know the LA riots were was over 25 years now and we're still with the same problems even worse yeah. uh, so it's very relevant in present today. day hey, it's still relevant today. it's gonna be relevant it's gonna be relevant until we can fucking figure our shit out yeah but we should also note that it's part of a trilogy of family-centered films that that you've um directed uh, along with Gook you did Miss Purple which is already out and and you have to all see it. That one was also set in LA, Koreatown, um, about a relationship between a brother and sister. And um, Blue Bayou, which I'm very excited to see about a Korean adoptee story set in Louisiana, of all places. But beyond the family connection between these trio of films, I love how you talk about your interest in, in exploring how do we intersect and how do we coexist. So, we, it, you know, it's, it's, it's more than just about your perspective of, um, from a Korean perspective of the LA riots, you intertwine like both the Latino community as community in this particular mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I think, uh, I think that's one of my, my main purposes is not just bringing empathy to our community, which is very important, but it's also how we can 
coexist in this country because um, as we can see, we can't get along right now. Yeah. Well, yeah. Um, I'd love to talk about your personal connection to the story and why you felt so compelled to write the story. Because uh, you could have just gone on your charmed acting life and not have to go into the indie filmmaking world. But this is a very personal uh, connection to you because you were uh, 11 years old, not even a teenager at the time of the LA uprising and your own father, he lost his shoe store. Can you talk a little bit about what you remember from that time as an 11 year old and what kind of impact that had on your family? And this is a picture of you and father in the LA time. Yeah, could you send me this too? I don't have this. Yeah, I'll send um, you the photo album. <laughs> um, I, dude, this is a beautiful photo, wow. I gotta, yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, um, so my dad owned a business in on the border of Paramount and Compton. And, you know, uh, my dad was also in the arts in Korea. He was an actor and, and then he gave that all that up to, to move to the U.S. and start over. And and he did all the dirty work. You know, he, he just started from nothing. You know, we, we started off in a one bedroom apartment and, and he worked the flea market for over 10 years. He worked seven days a week for over 10 years. And, and uh, yeah, he had the shoe store, athletic shoe store, not a women's shoe store in this area and and um during the LA riots I was 11 and and my dad had to stay at a store and, and protect it um the most you know being 11 um he commuted every day from Irvine to Compton which is a, not a short commute um so that we can go to a nice public school and all that stuff and I remember going to church going on and they're telling anyone who was affected to raise their hands and no one would raise their hands. I looked at my sister and I just shook my head. No, basically, uh, we were embarrassed. We were embarrassed because it was kind of like, I don't think anybody else's parents worked in the hood. Um, and so, you know, it was, that's what I remember. But then secondly, I remember watching the television and the news and being like, it was just everywhere. You can avoid it. And, and, um, and, uh, you know, just understanding that my dad was there. Um, and I didn't quite understand how dangerous it was until later in my life. But, you know, that's just what we had to do. And the most profound thing, the most profound thing is um, my dad, my mom really raised me to love others. And never did I ever hear my parents say one racist thing about wow. anybody. Never ever in my whole life. And you know, Koreans can be pretty well, yeah, racist. I learned you know, the hard and, way. And, yeah. I learned the hard yeah. way because um, I went to Korea uh, in the 80s and I, to my uh, my relatives, I said, there's no gamdungi opsoyo, yogi gamdungi opsoyo. And they were like, yeah. where did you learn that word? I'm like, uh, from America. And so I was actually using a racial slur against yeah. black people in Korea. So yeah. I, I know what yeah. you mean. Yeah, but your like, yeah. parents so, never you know, said, yeah anything against and in real life okay so from there you know writing the story how much of your your father's experience and your family's experience uh, was included in in the story uh, about that so yeah that was what we found about it was that my dad when i asked him about it and asked him if he had any hatred towards you know african americans or what he felt at the time i mean uh just very was you know kind of like not emotional about it and nonchalant about it and he was just like they had a reason to be angry and i thought that was quite impactful to me because i was like how could you not be angry they like destroyed your shit you know um but uh, he understood. He understood on a very, you know, sort of foundational level why they were, why, what, ha what had happened. Um, yeah, you know, it was just the exploration of that. You know, the, the 25th anniversary was coming up. Uh, I've been wanting to make a movie about the LA riots for, for about five years. Me personally, as an actor, I had auditioned for maybe five different versions of it, even including a Spike Lever at Universal. Wow. Um, 
And I remember that audition really was impactful because, wow, I just remember being in that audition and it was just a improv audition. So they put us in a room with two black people and, and me and another Korean guy. And they just wanted us to improv. But the audition ended up being was us just, I didn't do it, but the guy I was with just kept saying the N word over and over. And then the, 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 the African Americans that we're improving with were just saying every sort of racial, Asian racial slur there was. And I was like, it really impacted me because I just walked out of that room feeling violated. I felt like on both sides, you know, feeling like this guy was saying that word so freely, so hatefully. And these people were saying, and I was just like, wow, that's how hate looks like. And it wasn't constructive. I didn't think that improv was very illuminated that there was, you know, so I wanted to explore that. Um, the big thing was I knew there was a few other documentaries and films being made to lead up to the 25th anniversary. And I just felt like they weren't going to tell the Asian American perspective. So I know, I knew that even at my tiny micro budget level, if I didn't do it, no one was going to do it. And I was right. No one was even thinking about it. Wow. It. wow. And um, can I ask you now that we know, you know, uh, you've made the film and uh, I, I really can't think of any other uh, uh, near films that tell the story from the Korean American or Asian American perspective. This might be one of the only that are out there. Was this something that you did to tell a personal story or was this approach more on behalf of the Korean American community? Both. You know, I don't think you can separate the two. I think um, every, um, every story comes from some sort of personal place otherwise, even if it was like, a, you know, say like, a Marvel film, if I didn't have like a personal investment in it, there's no way I could do it. You know, life's too short to do stuff that I don't. Um, so, you know, I do, I did want to, you know, put our experience amongst the, the plethora of other experiences that were being told. And then secondly, yeah, I mean, we went through it. So like, I have a perspective on it and obviously this is fictionalized, but it was very personal to me. And, uh, I wanted to, there's a, a million things I wanted to do with the film and I maybe accomplished like a third. The big thing was to say like, look what happens when we don't communicate with one another. We, we lose what's mm -hmm. most precious to us. And secondly, you know, the intergenerational mm -hmm. conflicts between brothers and you know, siblings and then also the older generation, how we don't even within our own cultures, how we don't see eye to eye. So it's not just a racial thing. It's even within a, we have a lot of issues with one and we need to communicate and then how like you know even across racial lines we kind of, we we share a lot of the same pain and, and it's not we're actually fighting the wrong sort of fight sometimes it's 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 institutionalized and it's also coming from above and we're just in the situation and we have no sort of other option but to try to blame each other mm. um you know so you know but then yeah, so that sort of relationship between Eli and Camilla, who's an African-American girl in the thing, who's 10 years old, it was just like, she comes from such a place of innocence, and then Eli comes from such a you know, jaded place, and how does that dynamic work, and how does she change these brothers' lives, and also, like, how does it affect her brother's life, who's African-American, and just to show how everybody was actually in pain together. Yeah, well, and what your father had taught you about any ill will toward African Americans uh, and other people of color, that kind of came through in the movie. I was thinking about this, about just how compassionate Eli as a character was towards Camilla and even towards Keith, even though Keith beat up his brother, right, and was stole his shoes, you are still so incredibly compassionate towards him. And I kind of, I really appreciated that because we don't see that, right? We don't we always see it the other way around. So I really appreciate that. I, I, I your father, <laughs> he's so delightful in this movie and in mind. Um, but it, it took some time to get him to actually 
be convinced to join the, the, the movie. Can you talk about why that was, given the fact that he was a child actor in Korea, so he had acting chops. Why is it that he wouldn't want to be in your film? He just didn't understand. Well, first of all, he doesn't want to be bothered. He's a he's a curmudgeon, you know. He's very grumpy, <laughs> um, and he just you know he's like he's like why would I want to like stay up all night, you know, and and uh, you know not be able to sleep. You know, he's very regimented in terms of his schedule. He's just like it doesn't. He knows what it takes also to make an indie film. So he's just like no, thank you. Um, find somebody else and. The big thing was he's just like he just didn't understand he's like why do you want to like revisit such a painful time in in our life and i said it because it's important that that we put this story out there so people remember and can learn from it you know our past experiences and but he was just like he just biggest reason he didn't want to be bothered um so how did you convince him you just kept bothering him yeah i just kept being like you know there's nobody out I, and I looked, you know, I was like, I, I'm looking, there's nobody else. I wrote this for you, you know, and, and then it became a parent child sort of guilt where I'm like, dude, do you want me to succeed? Do you want me to uh, like, want me to be broke and poor my whole life? This is something I feel like I have to do for my career and something I, I feel very passionate about. And as an artist, this is something if I don't do, I'll feel very stilted and, and suffocated if you, you know, so I think, yeah. But, you know, he was very, I got to say, you know, and I think it's also funny now, but at the time, to be honest, it was very difficult. He was the most difficult wow, person Wow, really? Did, yeah. Because, you know, just... Was, was yeah. most of uh, what we saw on camera, was that first that because you didn't, he didn't want to be bothered, he just kind of jumped right into it? You know, that's what's funny about this film is people think it's all improv. It's not it's in and, and we did rehearsal we did with the little girl for a mm. month you know with the brother I rehearsed with David so for a month and then you know I rehearsed with my dad so that's not the reason it looks like improv is because it was over it was rehearsed so much that people knew we knew what to yeah. do um but no just from the hours like he said he only worked certain hours of the day like a certain window like amount of that he said he, he had problems with his wardrobe, <laughs> or, you know, he, um, you know, and, but he's an actor, you know, okay. and he's so like, he had valid, valid. Um, and then the big thing is in life, he wears a, a hairpiece, he wears a toupee. And I was telling him, I was like, dude, you know, for the character, uh -oh. you have to take it off. And he just was like, what was that? What the, why the, why the fuck would I, wear? he was just like, why oh, we, the we missed hell? You. He, Oh, so my dad in real life he wore a piece. Oh, okay. I was and wondering about he just and I was too. like, yeah, and I was like, you have to take that shit off. And and he was like, why the hell would I show the world like that side of me? I'm like, because that's how that's the beauty of this character. You have to be stripped down. You can't have these like, you know, unless in the movie during the movie I rip it off. And <laughs> that would have been awesome. <laughs> But yeah, well, now, now thinking about it, I would have loved to. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, so as a Korean American, where I, uh, I, I just, every time you were so confrontational with Mr. Kim, knowing that he's right and how aggressive you were, like in his face and telling him to fuck off and you guys half, you know, uh, towards the beginning, it's so shocking to watch. Uh, well, it really it is. <laughs> So what what was that like for you to like tell your real life father those kind of those kind of things you know was there any I don't know uh, <laughs> any animal? I don't know man just my relationship with my dad and my parents my mom and everything is so sort of open in that way that it wasn't really uh, that big of a deal but it was um it was fun to play you know and it was fun to see my dad come to bat like go to bat like yeah I, and him bring it too yeah. like I, I thought that was so like just it was so fun to, to just be playful with him because we knew like you know and also you know mind you I, I made that film at a different time in my life I didn't have a kid yet you know I was just freshly married and I still had a lot of that angst and sort of anger inside of me so it was just 
you know, uh, through my work, a lot of times it's, you know, they, I'm trying to find and at least that because, you know, it's not healthy to sort of operate like that in real life. Um, so it was just really liberating. And, and, and um, for my dad to be just so <laughs> cool, cool about it was, was really just refreshing. And I, I will say, you know, that's the biggest takeaway from this film for me, for my personal life is I'll never forget that I was able to make this film with my dad and I'll never, and I'll just hold it so precious to, to, to my heart that, that uh, I was able to share this experience with him from this to, to the success in his success, going to Sundance with him. Mm -hmm. And, you know, at, at Sundance, he said, don't fucking even think about bringing me up on stage. I'm wearing hiking gear and I'm going to look so unpresentable that you can't. So you better not because you'll be oh embarrassed. God, and so when much. the credits, <laughs> Yeah, when the credits rolled and the lights came up, he pushed me out of the way <laughs> to get on stage. <laughs> so, so, you know, all those memories. And just, you know, like, yeah, but just being Korean and just wanting some approval from my dad and validation from my dad, mm -hmm. even though he's never said I've, I'm proud of you even afterwards, knowing, me knowing that he's proud of me, even though he never said it, yeah. I'll, I'll always, I'll always, you know, really, you know, take that with me till, till I die. Yeah. Well, I love the scene again, as I mentioned, of you guys yelling at each other. And what I loved about the uh, standoff scene is I watched carefully and I was watching uh, David, your brother, and he was like totally cracking up during that whole scene. I don't know if that was uh, meant to be, but here's a screenshot of that. I mean, just look at it. He is just enjoying you telling your father off and your father telling you off. And uh, I have to say this about David. So um, he is such a delight in this movie and he brings kind of a light and a, and a lightness and comedy. Is it true that the years in developing the story was originally meant to be a comedy? So, you know, my first, when I first started thinking about it five years before I made it, yeah. I wanted, it wasn't even David So, but I wanted to cast Bobby Lee in it. Um, Oh, really? And, uh, Which yeah, is a I wanted to catch... completely different feel. Bobby Lee would have been... You know, that's that's what's... You know, the, I think, you know, to be honest, I think the movie would have been just as good with Bobby. Yeah? You know, it's... What my idea was, I wanted to take Bobby, and, of course, innately, he's funny. There's nothing Bobby can do to make him, like, not just inherit comedic effect, even in his pain. Mm-hmm. But I wanted him to play it real. I, I, I still think even to this day that there's Bobby Lee is a really untapped uh, well of, of talent. You know, I think that there's a, there, there's a depth to him and I don't think that it has been fully realized in, in film. And I think that, um, I think it's still, it's still something I'd like to explore. But uh, yeah, you know, I wanted it to be, more comedic just a little bit more comedic than it was and then but then you know with with me and david and the way it evolved i was like okay you know the comedy will yeah and it was and it, it, and it um, happened but, unexpected yeah, and times I just, too you know yeah i love that and mm -hmm. and for those who yeah. don't know you and you and david uh david so is a big youtube star and um and uh mm -hmm. you were actually uh working with him for many years and knew him for many years before uh, before group. Um, and you know, it, that's, what's so cool about it because you were part of the small Asian American artist community and you guys kind of tapped into each other. Can you talk about that? Yeah. I mean, um, you know, being an actor, like it's, you're just always trying to find, you know, collective like-minded creators to, to, uh, collaborate with. And I always, when YouTube started to hit in 2008, I just realized that that was the future. Uh, and, you know, it was such a great avenue for Asian Americans to expose their talent because it was, at the time, now there's a, this fucking algorithm and everything, but at the time it was just open to the, 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 for, the for the audience to dictate what they wanted to see. And it was so funny. It just showed that Asian Americans were yearning for this Asian American created content so naturally, I aligned with them, and I was just like thought that they were so innovative and and uh, their time they were, 
So uh, anybody who is just just making interesting stuff, I just I was I really try to be humble and try to align with them and pick their brain and and see what they were about. That's where that all came from. And he was he actually singing in the movie? Was that his voice? Oh yeah, of course. Uh, David's an incredible singer. Smooth. Smooth like velvet. So I wrote, I, I wrote that into the film. I mean, you know, that, that role is tailored for him. Wow, wow. Well, and um, I love how you um, are committed and, and also somewhat responsible in using untapped talent or emerging talent in your movies. And uh, Simone Baker, who played uh, Camilla, is definitely in that category. You found her at a community the art center because it's in South Central. Yeah. Um, can I ask you, was this based on any relationship that you had on real life? Because this is so unlikely. I just wonder how you came up with that and just, you know, and you made it so precious, this particular relationship. I mean, it's just love for a fellow human, you know? I don't know, like, it's not like I had to base it off of any relationship in my life um, other than the fact that I, I don't know, like, uh, I love, I'm in love with everybody. I'm in love with Latinos. I'm in love with Chicanos and African Americans. And it was just felt like the best way to, to tell the story because it was so unlikely of a friendship. And, mm -hmm. and when I went around, around to pick film at first, when I was trying to get financing for it, everybody just thought it was so weird. And I was like, okay, then I, it's more of a reason to lean into it because they just didn't understand that, like, an Asian man and a, and a young black girl could have a friendship. And I was like, why? It just made me really sort of angry. I was like, why not? Mm. Like, what's so weird about that? Mm. Like, what, like, what is so unlikely? Like, what is so foreign about that? Like, anyone could be friends, you know? And so that's why, you know, I really felt the need to lean into it. But, um, you know, I went to USC, you know, I, I obviously I grew up, you know, at my dad's store in, in, Paramount neighborhoods a lot and grew up at Swap Meet a lot and grew up around a lot of Latino, uh, Chicanos and, and African Americans. And then, you know, um, I went to USC and I did a lot of community service around the, 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 you know, my school, which is South Central. And it didn't seem, you know, and it was my first time at Limer Park. So like, you know, and also I always thought that it was so cool that the late John Singleton, the late and great John Singleton, he's gone now. Um, he was such a pioneer, and his office was right next door to, to you know, the Fernando Pulamart Center. It was next door, so I remember going there for a few auditions, and it was just natural to stop in there and be like, "Hey, is there any way that like you would be open to letting me meet your kids?" You know. Um, but um, it felt organic. I don't know. It's uh, it's it's the reason why it needed to be done. Because, you know, people people just aren't exposed to, to Crenshaw or, you know, those areas. Well, and, and Simone really stepped up to the plate. She rose to the occasion given that she didn't have a lot Absolutely. of, she didn't have a lot of um, experience, but she was so natural. And I'll tell you, you gave her one of my favorite lines in the movie. You know which one that is? Mm -hmm. I'm a motherfucking gangster. Oh, my God. When she was just, like, revving herself up to go into Mr. Kim's liquor store. <laughs> Yeah. I was like, oh, that's so, that's such a meme. But what's interesting is she's so young and 10 and 11, I'm sure she doesn't talk like this in real life. So what was that like working with a child who's so fresh and um, so innocent in such a, you know, in, in, in having such difficult lines and dealing with difficult situations? Like that? Well, like you're saying, she's just a natural She's natural talent. I mean, she is just, you know, uh, is is just special as they get, you know. And and that's what's cool about my job is I get to play, you know. It's not there's no like hierarchy. I'm at the we're at the we're at the same level, and and we're coming to be, you know, childish and open up and 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 explore. So it was just in the first first week us rehearsing it was no we weren't going over the lines we were just hanging out and and I was teaching her how to skateboard and and uh we were just like hanging out at the art center and just being kids you know and, and 
And then it was just like a slow sort of process of, okay, like these are the scenes and talking about the scenes and helping her understand like why they exist and, and you know, what the dynamics are and what our relationship is. And then once she has started to understand that, then it's about like bringing the lines into it. And, and, but then it was like, you know, we did tons of improv to get her comfortable with the situation. And what's always funny is if you give a parameter and you give them sort of a start and stop, they tend to naturally gravitate towards what's written anyways. Mm. Um, and then, so when she's natural for her and uh, I just gave her a lot of room to like, feel like it was her, her. And you know, the funniest thing about Simone is she's the girliest of girls. Like her favorite color is pink. You know, she's, <laughs> she's, she's, she's not like this tomboyish girl. So she's acting, you know, she's like, and the thing that I, you know, I've told this a million times at Q and A's, but like the thing that shocked me and, and the, that when I truly knew she was an artist was she has that crazy scene with Keith where it's very violent, violent and her brother shakes her and says, where are the shoes and goes nuts on her or where, you know, um, and we were at lunch and I knew I was going to have a traumatic scene to do for a 10 year old. But I couldn't find her and I was looking for her. I was like, hey, and I even asked her mom, and I was like, have you seen Simone? I'm trying to look for her and, and she's like, I don't know. And I walk into the bedroom where she's supposed to do the scene. She was in the dark. She had a photo of her mother, of her real mom and just like crying, like tearing up crying. And mm. she was emotionally preparing herself for the scene. And that's what a professional does, mm -hmm. she, you know, especially in my, Eisner, it's like emotional preparation and and I was just so shocked that a 10 year old had the intuition to naturally intuitively do that so I just closed the door and I gave her her space and that's how much of a professional mm -hmm. she is mm -hmm. now that's just natural that's just natural talent that's just um an innate sense of 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 being a performer and and I, I was really just blown well, away well you and your producers have a good eye and like I said um another testament to your commitment to uh, helping emerging artists. Still in college, mm -hmm. <laughs> still in film school, Auntie Chang, and uh, you gave him a chance, and now he's gone But look, yeah, look, he's, he's done yeah. so many things. He just had a film that went to Berlin. You know, he, he just did my, that, uh, you know, is, you know, has Alicia Vikander, and, and Macro is behind it, and E1, like, you know, and it's a, six million dollar budget like he he's um he's flourishing and but that was that's all him mm -hmm. that's, that's you know it's not about me giving him a chance it's about that was already there you know yeah. it's 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 him it's all him well let's talk about directing and then we're going to get to some q and a's I'm, I'm hoping that along the lines some of you guys who have questions answering some of them there's a lot of questions so i apologize that we're not getting to all of them but um for this particular film it was set during specific era set in the 90s micro budget uh originally 30,000 you raised 56,000 on kickstarter um and i'm sure that that's uh what uh kind of um, is behind the story of choosing it to be black and white um and i'm wondering what other choices did you have to make because it was such a micro budget film well you know the micro of it all that's not a limiting thing it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a nice challenge to have because you have to really fundamentally break down what is important in the story so it's it wasn't really a restrictive thing um the black and white wasn't wasn't necessarily a budget thing at all um one of the biggest influences for this film the end it's a french film it's the film that made Vincent Cassell famous and it's also during it was made during uh the same time as as LA riots and and it's about the French sort of you know there's these police sort of riots and 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 this kid in the film you know gets beaten up and is in is in critical condition these three disillusioned friends one's one's Algerian one's black and one's French and they're just tra traipsing around Paris and and Vincent Cassell keeps saying, you know, if, if that kid dies, I'm going to kill a cop. I'm going to kill a cop. And it's the same sort of energy. Mm -hmm. So to, an homage to that, I was like, okay, I want to make my film black and white. And that film influenced me so mm -hmm. much. Um, so that was a big sort of thing. And then homage to 90s filmmaking, you know, Kevin Smith, that was the clerks. That was also black and white. And, 
And I was just like, you know, you know, when you watch old NWA music videos, like they're some of them are black and white. It's just That's raw, pretty. sort of visceral feel it to it. Feels like you're on the so, Yeah. Yeah. So there's a, so it's just like a, it's just like a, a rawness I felt like to it. And also want to shoot digital and I, I wanted to feel like film. I couldn't, I, if I could have, I would have shot 16. It was just a, a way to get there was black and white with vintage color lenses and, and uh, you know, create a lot of atmosphere. We did a lot of things to texturize the the set and atmosphere. And you look at all the cars, they're like very texturized and old and, you know, and the, the clothes, we distress them a lot. So they, they, they look like they're very worn in. And these were all decisions that we made to give it sort of that 90s nostalgic, you know, hood feel. Um, you know, when I watched like, like, you know, visceral thing to it that, that I was trying to capture and, that was a and and fundamentally, from a philosophical standpoint, the Ellie rights are always seen as a black and white issue, <laughs> but it's not. It's not just nothing is ever just black and white. They're so mean, and that was another reason to make it black and white. I was just like, okay, this is just visually su supposed to be simple, but there's so much gradient between the black and the white that that it's uh, philosophically something that I felt like said a lot mm -hmm. what about um the music you know music and dance the, the film starts with you know dance and it ends with dance and then there's uh this man eater music that shows up in the middle of you know just out of nowhere uh i'm wondering uh, uh first of all did you have to spend a lot of money to get the man eater uh you know rights to that but also, like, just if you could talk about your choice of using music and dance to tell the story. Yeah, you know, I think um, with a subject like the riots, you need some levity. Uh, and I understood that very early on. And I felt like all my films have sort of a lyrical quality to them. And, and I felt like dance in this film was a huge thread that I wanted to, uh, wanted to weave through the entire film. And from the perspective of a of a ten year old kid, there's this innocence and sort of freedom that comes with being a kid. And I wanted to start the film like she was the catalyst of this whole story. She, she was the one that, of of this story. So that's why she's looking at this burning building and she's just uh, you know kind of flowing in this dance. And and we know that going to be sort of the, the the glue that holds this film together. So, you know, when they dance the man eater, it's just like, it's because of her. If, if it was just the two brothers, there's no way they would do that. You know? And it's just like, she brings this sort of love and freedom and, and innocence and to, to the film. And, and I felt like it was really physicalized through dance. Um, so, you know, that's one of the big reasons I put it in there. And, and, um, and it was just something that that uh, bookmarked the film so beautifully because she's just so such a wonderful beacon of, of life. The film we've lost her, and it's such a huge sense of loss that that we just like when she's dancing, it just looks like it looks like a flower that's just sprouting from the ground. Like she talks about on the right. roof, she says, "You know, um, well, you know, I don't really see a lot of flowers. Mm -hmm. All I see is dirt and concrete." Uh, might as well. She's that flower, and that's what I'm trying to say. She's just sprouting mm, out of the earth. Right, right. Yeah. Well, I, there's a couple of questions. Someone said that you were wearing a clipper shirt at the very beginning. This guy's a Lakers fan, and so they just wanted to ask you if that was intentional because you were a Clippers fan. <laughs> yeah, you know, no, I'm not a Clippers. I'm a Lakers fan, but 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 uh, uh, you know, Clippers a lot of times they don't get they don't get any love and. And I felt like it's like this guy can't even have the right shirt. On, you know? <laughs> it's like it's like immediately, immediately the audience is gonna hate this fucker, you know. It's like he can't even have a fucking Lakers shirt on. He has a clip, and that's how broke ass he's like. He's like, I'm sure the Clippers shirt. I felt like the Clippers shirt was cheaper, so he's like, fuck it. Like I'm still, it's still LA. I'll just wear the Clippers shirt. Um, but it was that was an intentional choice. I was like, you know what, fuck. He's not gonna wear a Lakers shirt. He's gonna. He's gonna wear a Clipper shirt, you know. Um, I, w I knew I wanted some some graphic sports tee because that was like what was hot back then, you know. Like whether it's the Rams or Raiders or whoever it was, like you know, the Padres, like ha Padres had to like wherever you're from. It was like that's the shirt you're gonna, you know, you're gonna wear that that sports tee. But uh, 
that's the answer to um, that. So life after Goog, you, you said it in an interview, like, I need to go out and just fail. I just need to keep making films to get better. I can't wait for six years in between. What is the sense of urgency? Because in the last six years, you have made three feature films, which is incredible, right? And two of them made into Sundance. Um, so you made, you know, Goop, Miss Purple, Blue Bayou. Uh, what's your sense of urgency here? Dude, we don't have enough time to tell all our stories. It's like, it's just so, it's so, it's like finally, like there's a appetite for it and there's a way to, you know, the avenue to, to get it out there. And especially with online streamers and everything, um, within my lifetime, there's so much to say with not enough time. And, you know, like each film takes, you know, minimum two right. years. So how many stories will I be able to tell within my lifetime? And I've, I have so many things that I want to, to express, you know, so that's the urgency. And then also, you know, it's just, um, it's just, uh, that's my purpose. That's my, that's sort of my, my goal is to is to tell our stories and bring but in a very non-traditional way you know i always talk about how like crazy rich asians and you know like uh whether it's all these other things other stories that are being told is from such a vantage point of being middle class or or uh wealthy or like having the the op you know the opportunity to work about like I tell stories about the blue collar you know if you notice all my stories are like these people are just trying to just they're not thinking about fucking college they're just trying to like survive, survive. Yeah. <laughs> and there's a, the, and a lot of us like a lot of us grew up that a lot of us is that and the, but then the, yet these Asian American films are always about the fucking dra dragon mom cool man like that's the, those stories will be told but like how about like the other 99% that's just trying to make just trying to make ends meet man and like I do that that void mm -hmm. you know we have the James one we have the John Chu's we have the Justin Lin's and mm -hmm. and they're gonna do they do what they do incredibly well well fuck like what about like who's gonna service the other side of it um who's gonna and a lot of people don't have the perspective of like of like the hood and you know and I'm like well I can do that so <laughs> so uh that's you know I I'm I'm a filmmaker of the people I'm in service of the people I'm not like trying to be on my fucking you know, have like almighty, you know, creator, you know, filmmaker that I need to be. No, I'm, I'm telling the lowest of the low. And I, and the way, if you see the way I make my films, like it's, I'm, I'm of the earth, man. Like there's no, nothing bougie about what I do. So. Well, I love that because, you know, you say you're a filmmaker of the people and honestly, you've had a pretty hard life as an actor and you've had a, pretty good streak as a filmmaker having been at Sundance not just once but twice and after you uh, finished making Miss Purple you got a phone call from the legend the pioneer of Asian American cinema Wayne Wang asking you to be in his movie coming home again um, mm -hmm. I'd love to hear your perspective as an actor as a direct you know a filmmaker an actor turned filmmaker who then goes back to acting with a legendary Asian American filmmaker and what that experience was like, because you probably, am I, am I right to assume that you probably didn't just show up as an actor, but you were also watching him as a director, right? Absolutely. I mean, Wayne, it's one of the most pleasurable experiences that I've had as an actor. He really welcomed me into his arms as a co-creator. You know, at first, he offered, at first he offered uh, to let me co-direct with him. Wow, really? Um, that's that's how, that's how, that's how prideless and sort of, you know, generous he, yeah. yeah, generous he was. And I told him, no, 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 no. Like, if I'm going to be in your thing, I, there needs to be one captain of the ship. And I, I want to be in service to your vision. Let me just come on as an actor and, and you know, but like, you're the captain. I, I just, I just want to service you. Um, but absolutely, I came in and I learned a lot, you know, and it wasn't so much technical, you know, like technical is technical. You can, everyone can learn the technical aspect of filmmaking. It's very, it's nuts and bolts. Like that's the sort of, you know, you know, 
just every day like technician of it all like technical part of it all but like he really taught me and patience and you know and also the the space to like the space to let ideas happen i mean you know to um and also the challenging of the material and you know even in post he just he's just never quite happy with with what he's what it is constantly just like challenging it and i i just found it even at his age you know i'm just beginning and he's like you know a veteran and just at the polar opposite spectrums of of our experiences he's just just as childlike as me and that was the most just shocking and refreshing thing is we would get so amped and and i would we would hug each other after take sometimes we got so excited or high five and i'd just be you know 30 years my senior or whatever and i'm just like fuck yeah wayne <laughs> and he'd be like yeah fuck yeah just it was such a it was such a um he was very childlike which was very interesting to see you know and then when i see him do like the anniversary of joy luck club and going to watch him and talk like he's just so charming and he's just you know an og and and we're talking about like for the people he's for the people and also like he's the godfather of indie filmmaking period not just like not not just ken is missing is a is a legendary film and, and he was telling me his experience on that like mm -hmm. making it with five thousand dollars like he understands my struggle and, and he's definitely become a, a huge mentor of mine. And, and it was an experience I, I, I couldn't afford to miss out on. Right. So and so just like with, a very fortunate. So with that additional wisdom that you called from, uh, Wayne, from that experience with Wayne Wang, in addition to your experience from acting Miss Purple, as well as Blue Bayou, if you were to go back to Gook, you know, knowing what you know now as a father, as uh, a more experienced filmmaker, uh, as a more experienced actor, is there anything in the movie that you would have changed or that you would have liked to done differently? Absolutely not. It'd be a different movie then. Like, I don't, I made that movie at a certain time in my life and a certain need to, to say something. So it, it, every movie is what's supposed to be. And as an artist, I'm not looking back. My job is to continue to push, continue to move forward. It's it's the only way we spend. It's like, even if I'm moving an inch, it just an inch at a time, I have to just continue to move forward and not think about anything in retrospect or, or wrestles. It, it is absolutely imperative they continue to move forward and and you know whatever i learned from wayne that'll be folded into me cellular mm -hmm. on a cellular level and it'll become part of who i am and it'll inform mm -hmm. the next film but i'm not trying to think about the mistakes i made shortcomings that i've had but like i don't ever look back on on any of the films i'd make and think like oh, i should have done this differently fuck that beautiful because of where i was in my well career. you did say that you said you pulled your dad's toupee off in the movie. <laughs> yeah, that would, would be been funny, been. yeah. Um, uh, there's a question here about your dad. Did your dad give you any acting tips or... or um, and did he help write the script? No, he never helped write the script. Um, like, that'd be impossible to work with him in <laughs> okay. that capacity. But, uh, but uh, no, yeah... Not really. I mean, like, you know, I don't ask him, you know, I think we have separate, we have different approaches to acting and, um, you know, like he, he's only said one thing ever to me, which is something that's so fucking obvious. I got really mad at him. He's like, you know, as an actor, you have to be natural. I'm like, shut the fuck up, Dad. <laughs> like, what kind of note is, what kind of note is that? Like, I love that. I, I, but I love the relationship with your dad, that even though he says something like that, you still love him. Um, let's yeah. Really quick about um, the role of film festivals because um, he was there with you at Sundance, okay? So he said he didn't want to go up, but, but but in general, the role of Sundance, um, the role of film festivals rather, as a an independent filmmaker. Here you are um, accepting your uh, next uh, filmmaker award over at Sundance for emerging filmmakers, and look how happy you are there. That must have been such a moment. I was really sick too. I was. 
really send you, you send everything. <laughs> <laughs> and then this photo, which I love, but uh, your dad's missing from this photo. What up with that? He didn't want to be in the photo. He's being fucking grumpy. He is so funny. But like, can you talk about the experience of Sundance and the importance of film festivals, like even our festival here, the San Diego Asian Film Festival, for um, just career for the careers of indie filmmakers? Film film festivals are so damn important, and we're feeling that now, not being able to have them. You know, right now, like mm -hmm. uh, my recent film, we were we were aiming for Cannes. And, you know, it's just like when you go to a festival, you know, like that, it's just like it automatically legitimizes me to the industry and allows people to have confidence in my voice. Mm -hmm. And especially Sundance, which has been a huge champion of mine in your festival. It's just like it's just an avenue that when we don't have the studio behind us and we make these films independently, we don't have the, 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 the print advertising budgets that they put behind films to get awareness for them. The film festivals are our p &A. The film festivals are our advertisement. It's the way we get introduced to the world. It's the way we get exposure. It's how people get awareness about what we do. So like, you know, like the San Diego Asian Film Festival has always been such a champion of mine. And, and it's so important that they exist because otherwise there's no aggregator of, of the community to come out and, and feel the sense and need to support our, our artists. So like, that's why these festivals are, are um, important and, and without them, it's just like a vapid sort of vacuum where, where okay, these, these works will come out, but no one will ever find them. I don't know how, you know, you, you, even if you are lucky enough to sell it to Netflix or whatever, like it, if Netflix doesn't advertise and put a lot of marketing dollars on it or put it on the front page, no one will ever find it. How are they supposed to find these films? Right, so, so like that's, we're, we are that's the importance of them. The festivals are the trusted curators for the community, right? There's tons of uh, you know content out there, but they trust us to bring what the best to them. And so I appreciate you saying that about the role of film festivals because we're all we're all trying to freaking figure out how we're going to do this, you know, because uh, life has changed dramatically, you know. Um, and you know, it, during this quarantine or as a result of COVID, how has um, you think that it, that's going to affect your career in any way? Ain't gonna affect my career, cause cause I'm gonna fucking keep set, you know. Like I'll find yeah. a way. Um, that's that's the other thing in our community we need to instill is like we have to we have to understand the fundamentals and the the sort of mindset to be become unstable. You know, I think that we we just sometimes we're we're too. You know, and like you've done with your film festival, you've become so unstoppable in, in the community in your quest to, to discover talent and, and champion our, our, our voices. You know, we have to have that sort of collective, you know, mentality uh, in order for us to make any headway. And it's, it's not going to affect me. Absolutely. I'm dealing with it right now. I'm fucking in Korea trying to figure out how to do my next film, how to finish the film I'm on, you know, like, um, I'm prepping a TV show right now and, and I don't know when the, you know, like the production's going to start, uh, and the, the limits on the, the amount of crew that we can, it's, 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 um, uh, from a uh, producing standpoint, it's difficult, but, but, but those are just obstacles and we just need to overcome them. But, but um, you know, as for film festivals, it's tough. Like, how do we figure out how to exist online? How do we like, we have to, we cannot rely on just the old models. We have to adapt with the times. So we have to figure it out like you're doing like this whole zoom thing. Like I was excited and wanted to do this because you guys are trying to figure it out and I yeah, want to be a part thank of that. You so much for that. We have a, a question from Valerie Gomez. She wanted to know if you had any advice for filmmakers who are just starting out out um, and she wanted to um, make sure, like advice on how to pursue making films that show important events in Asian American history. What kind of advice would you have? Well, don't make it a documentary. We don't, we don't, um, it, because then I'd rather just see a documentary. It would be more mm -hmm. effective, you know, to just get the facts. Um, even though documentaries definitely have a point of view, you know, and, and they're, 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 they're film. There's 
in their own right. Uh, if it's a narrative, figure out what you're in is and what your perspective is and what your characters want the needs are. That is more of um, a backdrop, more of something that can serve a story rather than the main thing. Because I don't need to see like historical events, you know, like it played out in film. That's boring, you know, like uh, that would be my advice. And how do you, how personally are you invested in that event? Like, and find your way in that way. But, uh, you know, I think that uh, the only way to figure that out is to, to do it. You have to, you have to continue to make a short make a fucking one minute short make a make a short film make a feature like you know people wait for opportunities to come you know to them or the money to come to them the only way to secure for sure that you're going to get you're going to get any headway is you just have to create you have to right. make stuff what about um your career as an actor turned filmmaker as you i mean the three last features of those three you acted in two of them uh, and in Miss Purple, you were just the director, writer. Um, are there unique challenges to be being both the actor and the director? Well, I no longer audition. Um, I, you know, I, um, I, I go act if I'm invited. Uh, so like Wayne Wang invited me, I'll go act, you know, like I just did this project in Korea, you know, but in terms of like, uh balancing it's is is it make sense like you know like uh i'm in a point in my career where where i don't have to act for money anymore so so it's more of like does it move the needle is it something to my heart like last year the only thing i auditioned for or i really fought for was kelly reichardt's first cow she's an american poet she's a one an insanely talented filmmaker and and the story was so beautiful that I was just like, I will fight, this is something I would fight to be a part of, but it was such an art film, you know, and, and um, I'm very proud of Wayne's film. And, and it was more about the experience than what, and the sense of play rather than what the final outcome team. In that sense, like, that's how I kind of choose what I'm going to do. Um, directing, uh, it's continued with uh with the sense of uh my agenda you know um i'm doing you know speaking up for the korean american adoptees and and my next film is uh gonna be probably uh, it's, it's also an asian american film but it's uh, like a manager client story and then i'm also doing uh three episodes of uh, pachinko and that's all like that's all like you know uh have the same sort of like umbrella of what I'm I feel like I'm put on earth to do. Pachinko, you mean based on the book is, is that based on the book oh yeah I love that book when is that coming out I don't know <laughs> you just act in it <laughs> cool um no I'm, well, I'm directing, directing it, it but, oh, I but, uh, you were uh, but but um with corona happening right now right right we're all trying to figure that out um well I just want to thank you so much for your time. This was um, a great a bit more about Goop. And um, can you, so Miss Purple is already out. Can you? It's on Hulu. It's on Hulu. And then what about uh, Blue Bayou? Blue Bayou, we are supposed to go to. This is Korean uh, Can, we, Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we here, wherever can, can got canceled. Yeah. We're now aiming for. Toronto, or uh, we're we're gonna think about Venice. I think Venice is canceled, and then Toronto, it's really up in the air. I don't, in my opinion, I don't see Toronto really happening in a substantial way. So I don't know. I don't know. We're 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 weighing our options. The movie is fucking absolutely beautiful. It's the best mm. thing I've done so far. It's 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 gorgeous. You know, like, um, and also like I think I I I, I do. I I'm hoping that I I did, you know, the adoption community. Uh, a, justice you know because it's about a, a korean american adoptee that's getting mm. deported um so you know it's it's some a story that no one's telling right now and i feel like i i, I felt like the, the need that it needs to be told and, and i hope it's embraced you know I, I i'm really proud of it and it came from a place in my heart from a very pure place so so and it's also I, telling a story that's actually happening you know and uh, 
I, I don't know if you know this, but I'm a mother of a Korean yeah. adoptee. So oh, wow. I appreciate yeah. you telling um, that story. Uh, we're part of a very large Korean adoptee network um, here. Yeah. In actually have some Korean adoptee friends uh, that are uh, watching us live. A shout out to all of you guys. Make sure yeah. that you flew by you when it comes out. Um, but yeah. just minute, I, I just wanted to thank you. I know things are, you know, mm -hmm. um, and uh, we don't know exactly what the future holds, but uh, there's one good thing about this quarantine is that we got a chance to speak to you live. from and So I'm just so yeah. incredibly, incredibly thankful. So thank you to you. Come to you. Come Thank you so much. Cheers. Cheers. And to our audience, if you enjoyed tonight's program, um, I hope that you would really consider supporting Pacific Art and I Talk. Uh, these are really, really tough times for all arts organizations and film festivals. So if you enjoyed tonight's program, please consider becoming um, a member or donating to PAC Arts. This is a critical time for our community, even a $5 donation would make a huge difference um, to the organization. And also as you exit tonight, you will be redirected to a web page where you donation, take a survey and learn more about uh, the work in which So on behalf of PAC Arts, we wanna thank all of you. Thank you again, Justin, and uh, give your daughter a big hug and kiss for us. <laughs> okay, I will, I will. Thanks everybody, good night.